If somebody comes up to you and says, dude, I love Ari, you're not going to be like, get yeah. the f out of here. Well, like, I am. You play, yeah, go ahead. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Put your f in his face. And I look over, and Joe Pesci is on our set directing. I'm not 36, and I think I'm doing pretty good for myself. And I look over, and Mike Tyson is shopping in the Versace store on our set and doesn't realize we're filming. While he's talking to me, he's dumping gasoline on himself. And Prince is just walking around in his pajamas, sucking on a lollipop. <laughs> now it's really going to get emotional. You know, the, it's a cliche that they say that, you know, after they pass on, they look after us. I, I really do feel like he does. Mm. All right. Sir, before we get into anything, you walked into my house and you said, you don't live here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by that? It feels like we're in the witness protection program and someone, <laughs> it, and I say this with love. Is it? it no. Well, no. <laughs> I, I, I feel like everything is matching really well and it looks staged. It looks like a home that has been staged to sell. It doesn't necessarily... You trying to buy? I wouldn't buy this place. No, <laughs> I thank you, though. I get on the phone with him. I'm like, uh, are you at the Walgreens parking lot? He goes, unfortunately, I am. <laughs> well, I'm just circling the Walgreens parking lot. I'm like, wait, why? I have to learn how to say no more often. What am I doing? I gotta go there. to like to a, just like a seminar where they just like show you how to say no. Right. Yeah. Well, that's wait, like for, Matt, wait, hold on. Just because, just the parking lot <laughs> and the staged home. Wait, matching yeah. in a bad way or in a good way? Well, Obviously, in a bad way. No, he wants to say no he's about. Saying you don't have any personality. No, I, I, I'm saying it's it. It all feels. It, 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 it's it's. <laughs> I, I, I celebrate you. And I love this. It just looks very, um, it look, it, it, you know, when things are like monochromatic and they're very premeditated. Yes. Yeah. So you know, it's there's, it, it, it's almost like you're, um, what's the word, a serial killer. I'm a Syrian. Yeah. I'm close. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> very nice. He grabs his phone. Yeah, like, yeah. I, gotta, I gotta leave. I, you know, I like your perspective. I'm gonna take that as a compliment. I don't it think you should. I don't think you should. It's going well that. together. You know. I no, like it all works. It I think the works. lights are throwing you off, and that's the serial killer. No, you killer. guys have a very professional situation here. I like it. <laughs> Let's get into it. Thank you so much. Okay, so l l before we jump into anything, I, I, I just want to let you know where I first saw you. The first time I ever saw you perform was a movie I was absolutely obsessed with. I watched over and over and over and over again, and my favorite scene was you in Rush Hour 2. Oh, wow. Okay. That was the first time I ever watched you. Yeah. And I would replay that scene over and over. So when we decided to have you on, I was trying to see if this was an improv scene because it yeah. made a huge difference. If you're, if you're rolling with like lines and the writers are killing it, but you brought that character to life and then I got to figure out how to watch the behind the scenes of that. Mm. And I watched you get ready for the movie. I watched a few of your takes. Um, oh. and, uh, all of it, was, it seemed improv. Every take was different. Each yeah. take was hilarious. Uh, my only line was, may I help you? So that was the only written line. Uh, so let me, let, me, uh, let me back it up a little bit. I'm going to... Uh, so before I did Entourage, I did 40 movies, and that was one of the 40. And um, basically, I was and am a journeyman actor. And uh, so basically, I would get an offer like Rush Hour 2. And, you know, I was... This is before Entourage, and I'm, you know, I'm scrappy, and I, again, you know, didn't know how to say no. I'm, not, You know, I just feel like I can take something and make anything and, and make something out of it. So you, I take a little scrap and make a meal out of it. So I knew, okay, look it, this is a big movie. It's Jackie Chan. It's Chris Tucker. Um, if I do my thing... Um, I will be a part of something special. Mm. And and these guys are crushing it and and Chris is a comedic force and Jackie is a, is a legend. He's a legend. Yeah, absolutely. So um they would just hire me to come in and give them a little pop, a little bit of comedy. So um I received the offer and I talk about this on stage. I tell the entire story uh in my one hour uh which I We're going to circle back to because yes. you're about to go on tour. Well, I'm on tour right now and um and I have been, you know, and it's interesting because people, you know, they once they hear uh, an actor is doing stand up, there's always hesitation. And I love that. And I I love being count out, counted out. And I have been my whole life. And that's a whole other story. But it's really fun to to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I unpack this story about how I got the offer um, to play the saleswoman 
It was for a, a woman, and um, and my line was, "May I help you?" So I decided to play him over the top, camp, gay, mm. and uh, you know, and and have a blast with it. And um, you know, you're gonna have to come to my stand up to watch me unpack the whole uh, thing. No, uh, I, was, no. I was like right there. No, but it, but I mean, it was it was an incredible experience. Uh, Chris Tucker and I ended up hanging out, and Jackie was amazing, and it was. Uh, it was definitely the craziest moment I've ever had on a set. Um, we're in the middle of the take, and all of a sudden I hear, what do you mean I can't stop here? Well, I knew Johnny Versace. And I look over, and Mike Tyson is shopping in the Versace store on our set and doesn't realize we're filming. No way. Yeah, and, and then I have to, the, the first, it, it just, it turns into madness. And How does that happen, <laughs> yeah. man? Right. Exactly. Also, what, what what stage of Mike Tyson are we looking at? Are um, we seeing the peaceful eating shrooms one? Or are we seeing, I'm going <laughs> to knock you the fuck out if you don't let me buy this bag? I'm going to knock you the fuck out and I'm taking mushrooms, but I haven't <laughs> yet had Hilarious. the come to Jesus moment, Mike Tyson. Oh, my, And you had to deal with him. I, I dealt with him and I stayed in character as that character dealing with Mike Tyson. I love how he's and living the, us on a cliffhanger so people come to his show. Bro. Yeah, I, I mean, with, it's like the when center, this cuts, I want to know the rest of it. it it's, the center, it's the centerpiece of my... Of my my one hour, just because it's just madness what happened, um. But but it was just so fun, and thank you for for referencing that movie. And you know that's one of these little roles where like literally, you know, there's that old cliche: there are no small roles. There are, there aren't. I mean, no matter if you're in the game, you're in the game. Mm -hmm. you, one line, you know, four page monologue, whatever it is, it's up to you to to, to bring it and to be prepared. And to make, you know, as much out of it as you possibly can. 100%. The reason I brought that up, could you crank the AC? I'm dying over here. Uh, the reason I brought it up was specifically is because, like you said, you nailed it on the head. We had two of one of the biggest stars, especially on that planet. Where It's not, it's not like their first time making that movie. It's the sequel, which means yeah. people are ready to buy that ticket and already sit down. Yeah. But the fact that they gave you nothing to work with. Here's that line, get it done. Yeah. And you stole the scene. That, that, to me, did it not put you on a different map? Was it your agents getting you on the phone to bigger auditions, trying to get you like, hey, he just performed with the two greatest, and behind the scenes, they're cracking up like nonstop. No, my phone didn't ring. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not, like, playing the victim. My phone didn't ring. But, um, no, it, it, you know, my, you know, it's just interesting. You just, uh, you, you know, it, it, it takes, like, a miracle for your phone to ring, man. It really does. So it's up to you just to keep grinding. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it's always been. You, you started out acting in acting classes in Chicago, am I correct? Yes. And your parents, they started this. Yeah, they have a theater um, just outside of Chicago in Evanston. And at eight years old, I jumped up on stage and, and started butchering really nice works of, like, uh, you know, uh, Salinger and, and Shakespeare and whatnot. My parents are... Our acting teachers and directors and 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 just artists who are, are dedicated to the love of their craft and all the kids, most of the kids were on scholarship because no one could really afford it. So um, they were woke when it was actually when it meant something, when they were just trying to like, you know, help people that that maybe didn't have a shot. Um, and so I learned by example from them. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't great at business. You know, I know you you admire people who are great at business. And we w weren't, aren't, we're just artists, you know, um, so that like if someone needed a scholarship, come on and come and play with us and come and learn how to act and, and do your thing. And, and it was never a money making venture, um, which is ironic because that I ended up playing a character that was like kind of the face of like, you know, agents and type A kind of movers and shakers. Did you ever yeah. wish that you had that agent in your life when you were starting? Absolutely, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, I think everyone would love to have an Ari Gold if they're if they're on your side. Yeah, yeah of Ari course. Ari Gold got shit done. I mean, yeah. come on. I like, yeah. there is there is no character like Ari Gold. You, that character like comes from you. Everything that you added on to that person, I mean, it's just like phenomenal and so much fun to watch. Well, thank you, and and that guy really exists. Ari Emanuel is, and you know, has emerged as yep. you, you get to see who he is. You know, he's running WME and um, AI, uh, the the sports company that he's running as well. Obviously, he and a group bought the UFC. 
Um, and uh, yeah, he's been crushing the game for a very long time. So mm-hmm. that character very much exists. How uh, much though? Yeah. How much did you bring his actual soul to life versus like the the hatred, the fire, the the insulting, the the comedic timing? Like, what did you add to that layer, or is, did you just embody this man and then bring it onto screen? Well, you know that's that's a <laughs> that's a tricky question to answer. Um, <clears throat> I, listen, he, uh, he, as soon as I read the script, I, I thought, because I knew Wahlberg, and I thought, and I'm not just saying this, but I thought, you know, people are going to be fascinated by this because they love the backstage life of Hollywood. Of course. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so, and HBO already had Sopranos and Sex in the City, so, mm-hmm. you know, we were in great company, and so I just thought if, and this character had one scene, Mark Wahlberg's agent is Ari Emanuel. There is a drama turtle, and he, all these characters exist or still do to this day. And so we could get very specific about the world and authentic. And, and I knew uh, Ari Emanuel um, has these amazing dualities in his life where you think he's a pig, but he's monogamous to his wife. There are all these things where you go, wow, this, this is fascinating, man. This guy, um, if, I, if I play it right and play it authentically, there's something really here. And he's the adult in the room, and these guys can fuck up, but Ari's going to always be there to kind of like, you know, uh, make sure that, that Vinny does the right thing, you know? And so I, um, you know, Ari Gold kind of brought that authenticity to the show and grounded it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, listen, I, you know, I don't want to, this isn't about me um, making comments about Ari Emanuel's personality, but he's a brilliant businessman, clearly, mm. um, who, you know, has heightened states of emotion. I think he's like, you know, second generation Israeli American. And I think they're misunderstood, very passionate people. Very passionate. Very passionate. Grabs life by the walls. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good exactly. at business, like we were talking about. Yeah. R- very good at business. And according to Kanye, we run all the banks and all of Hollywood and, and everything. Oh, that's but a slippery slope. That's a slippery slope. <laughs> we're not going to go down that route. No, come on. Open it up, bro. We need the clicks. No. Silence. Yeah. <laughs> In my yeah. mind, I was like, should I dig more? No. No, no, I'll ease up. I'll ease up. I'll ease up. No, but, but it's up to me. It was up to me to... Um, to play the character um, as authentically as I possibly could. And also, you know, I could bore you to death with how I played him. And You could never bore us to death. With okay. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think the reason why you haven't seen a lot of um, characters like that, um, and I think that there have been some attempts, you know, um, that character is, first of all, he exists, and, and Ari has... Ari Emanuel has that high energy kind of like type A aggressive, uh, reactive behavior. Mm. Um, but he gets stuff done. Now, um, could that character exist in today's climate? People would say no. But the, but the reality is, as we know, is that like, you know, first of all, I get to travel the country and do stand-up. So I'm on stage when people are yelling out lines from Entourage. So... There's a whole new generation of people that have seen it because of the pandemic and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a hunger for that. Me, that actually. They miss it. Yeah. I got into uh, it because of the, I, I was like, oh, somebody told me, like, dude, you haven't watched Entourage, the greatest <laughs> show to ever exist. So I was like, all right, I'll play one episode. And it was boom. It was, it was hooked. It was in. My yeah. question is this. Yeah. I'll say this because obviously you can't. Ari Gold was such a strong character. I think he broke out out of the show completely. There was people that wanted to be like him for Halloween. <laughs> There's people that call into That's your funny. show and tell you that they that changed his life and now they're they're assholes about things. And there's yeah. such a strong dynamic to the character itself. Why is it that HBO drops the ball and doesn't do a show about you taking over Hollywood and finding new talent? Yes. And know, if and if there was going to be, could you paint me a picture of what you think it would turn out to be? You know, it's funny you say that because. I, I don't know the answer to that. And, you know, it's ironic that I, I you know, played in a w- weird way the face of the backstage life of Hollywood. You know, this agent that could get it done. When the reality is, as an actor, you're not privy to that world. Um, I just produced my first movie. I've done 80 movies and never produced my own movie. It's, <laughs> I'm a late bloomer. So finally, like, 
And and by the way, I'm going to get to. I'm going to answer that question. It's going to be a long way around. No, please take your time. So my mother, who's been my acting teacher, and by the way, um, I talk about this on stage. Um, my mother, you know, to this day, we run lines together. And so everything I've ever said is Ari Gold. I've said to my mom's face <laughs> because she tests me on my lines. Yeah. And my mom was a total pro. When you think about the obscene and the absurd, you know, uh, crazy, offensive things I've said is Ari Gold. My mother never blinks. You know what I mean? So I, I've I've done that with her. So I love the the a, relationship between you guys. Oh, yeah, she's, she's that's an amazing. Actor. She's the best. She's the best. And and she gave me this. She said I, I I read this short story in the New Yorker about a Jewish tap dancer that ends up dancing for Hitler. And I was like, what? And the story was so powerful. And you know, um, I'm I'm leaving a lot out. Arthur Miller, who's one of the greatest playwrights, won the Pulitzer Prize, was married to Marilyn Monroe. He's a total icon. He wrote the story, and everything he's ever done has been produced. This hasn't. My sister Shira uh, uh, adapted the screenplay and directed it, and I, for 12 years, learned how to tap dance. And I played this character. And we are three weeks away from blocking picture, and wow. so what's so crazy is you, you bring that up. Why doesn't HBO? It's so interesting. I was having this conversation with someone on the team and they were like, why don't we go to HBO with this movie? You know, you have this great history with them. Yeah. You know, and I do. And as you know, hits are hard to come by. That's why they're There's remaking no, sex in the city. Exactly. And, they they, and they have things. to recycle. And right. also we could get into the whole industry of like, it's not where it used to be. Mm. You right. you had it right in the golden times. Like you guys were producing things that are going to be timeless. Now we were producing things to try to like make people feel comfortable and, and happy and like what the fuck it means. Before it was like the artist explaining to you what they feel, and now we're trying to mirror what we think the audience wants to feel. Like it's a very I, I don't mean to make you go into it, but yeah. that's what I see it being into. Well, I I think no matter what someone's intention as to why they're making a piece you either connect with it or you don't mm. so they may make a piece because they want to represent everyone and tick all the right boxes and they're operating out of fear and they have some sort of uh agenda but it doesn't matter what that is if they make a great story that is compelling that hooks you that's all that matters mm. but if that's not the case and it's very clear why someone made something, and that overrides um, the the story itself. And and they're putting the accent on the wrong syllable, yeah. and, and it's confusing to you. Um, then that's a problem. And I, I think there's a reason why people of your generation and they're coming up to me on the street all the time. We're going, bro. And there's like you know, there's like twenty year old kids going, Ari Gold. I'm going like, wait a minute. <laughs> Where did you see this? And so, you know, I think uh, to answer your question, it's a very long way around. To answer the question about HBOs, I don't even think they realize the audience that that show had and now has. And still has. Do you yeah. think it's no because of social to... media and then the, the feedback was more now audience versus like, uh, I don't know, like people that write about how good shows are? Do you think they didn't know how strong your audience were because of that? Like, no. say if it was made now and you could get feedback right away. Oh, yeah. Do you think no, they'd that, be like, oh, 100% we're running this? Well, that, that is a variable. It's a, that's a very good point. When, when we first started, you know, people would watch it in groups because it was just even before TiVo. It was like, you know, like people, like they would, they would Sunday nights, they would all get together and they would hang and watch it. So, like, even the ratings didn't show... So let's say there was mm. 10 times what people were actually watching because they were watching in groups. With their boys. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. And yeah. that, yeah. that continued to happen. And then I'd go to other countries and they're illegally downloading it. <laughs> so like, it's like, it's everywhere. And now you've got this whole... So, you know, I think of the HBOs of the world and I can see that because I'm one of the faces of the show. So I know the reach that it has. So I think once they realize that, they're, you know, they're a business... And, you know, maybe they'll be open to it. I have no idea. But in, in terms of, you know, in this climate, you know, to have characters that are abrasive, um, you know, that are equal opportunity offenders, um, I think that, you know, it would give certain people pause. But the reality is, if it's funny, if it's authentic, and it connects with an audience, that's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So why not do it? There is a relationship dynamic between you and your assistant, and your assistant is gay in the show, and you make so many gay jokes, but yeah. you end up loving it because you could see the love between you guys. Yeah. 
if HBO, and I hope to God they do, and they open up their brains and open up to that possibility, if they do bring it back, you know how fucking funny it would be to watch Ari in this modern day yeah. try to bounce his <laughs> way of Hollywood in yeah. this time of day and like the overly sensitive people? Yeah. I think it would, I think it still would be unbelievable. Oh, 100%. Because even. Even as abrasive as Ari was in the show, you, there had there was a lot of learning curves that mm. he went through where he'd be like, oh. yeah, okay, like I need to try and do this. And then you would fall yeah. and you, you'd you make the mistake again, but then you would try and learn and you try and change. And those, that's life, you know what I mean? That's part of like that character. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it would be really a fertile ground for comedy because Lloyd would be his pronoun consultant. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. so, oh, so you've yeah. thought about this. <laughs> well, you know... <laughs> Ari, you know, you're not a friend to the gay man. Oh, I am, Lloyd. I am. No, you're not. I'm sorry, you're not. You got everyone's <laughs> pronoun wrong. No, I got his pronoun right. His pronoun is has been, has and been. No, I don't know. You know, they, yo, we're taking that and we're pitching it ourselves. Yeah. We're pitching it ourselves. Honestly, we don't even need to do any more of the podcast. Let's wrap it the fuck up. There you Let's go. call it a day. I want to tap into what the life was behind the scenes of a show that was showing the behind the scenes of Hollywood. For example, when I go to a party now, I see everybody like this. And I see everybody like this and like this, and they're not in the moment. Mm. So I would like to just peel back a little bit of your personal memories, if you're vulnerable enough, and show me what did Hollywood look like when it wasn't about selfies, it wasn't about Instagram, it was about talented people in this Hollywood area, and we're gathered together, and this guy's getting fucked up, and it's pretty funny. You know, it, it, it's interesting. You know, we, we've all, I think, had a lot of time to reflect um, between pandemics and strikes and all these things. And... You're right. People, people, uh, social media wasn't uh, as prevalent back then. Um, I was because, and I have no regrets, but because I beat myself up to get it right so often, you know, and I just wouldn't, I was pretty hard on myself. And again, um, everything that I said as our gold was written. And, you know, Doug Ellen took great care to write and do it brilliantly. So I had to get it, you know, word for word. So those rants look improvised, but they are word for word. Those are word wow. for word. You should have him on the show, and you'll ask him, or he'll bring a script. The gentleman if, from the Victory Podcast, correct? correct? Yes. Correct. If you were to, if he were just to bring the script, and then you were to show the scene, and you run it in real time, every word, every punctuation, everything is written, and it's my job. That's and by the way, there's nothing special about what I did. All That's I did, fucking incredibly hard, yeah. bro. Well, it's what actors do. I mean, it's 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 simple. It's what, yeah, yes. I mean, you guys are more professional actors. I did like the more improv thing. I had like maybe two or three lines, and if I fuck up one word, cut. Run right. it back. So those yeah. monologues were at so much emphasis, and there's so much uh, 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 passion behind a certain word or a dictation. For you to nail all of that that's written verbatim, I would have never in a million years think that wasn't improv. Well, but that, but again, there's nothing special about what I did. You, uh, you, you know, my background, I, I was on stage at eight years old. So by the time I did, I broke out and won the Fresh Face of the Year at 37 years old. And I received the award and I said, there's nothing fresh about my face, <laughs> but thank you. You know, that was the first year of Entourage. So, you know, my coming out party was at 37 when pro athletes are retiring. That was, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that was my coming out party. So I had 30 years to prep. Mm. And, you know, I've studied at the National Theater of Great Britain. I studied Shakespeare there. I went to NYU. I went to, you know, all over. All I've, I've just been grinding my whole life, preparing for the moment. Like Shakespeare says, the readiness is all. Mm. So, you know, you're, I'm a stage actor. And so I would run... Ari Gold like I was doing a play and so you run it run it run it so by the time you hit the stage you're ready to go right you you can close. shoot the rehearsal but you got to be ready mm. okay so Incredible 30 writing that's insane. yeah great writing Incredible get Doug writing. down he'll he'll tell you that it was word for word I mean every once in a while I, they they would go okay Jeremy they would call it a freebie here's a freebie and so I would be allowed to to deviate a bit from the the lines but um they would always keep it. So what I what I learned was if I do it word for word, 
But if I can just make something pop, like, like I said, let's hug it out, bitch. That was an improv. That made it in and, be, and, and became a catchphrase. You know, little things like would just kind of seep in there and kind of get in. But I had to make sure that it it was. I mean, I'm Jewish, so it was like it was like reading. It was like be, reading out of the Torah. Like literally, it was word for word. You can't deviate. Mm. How good did that feel? That like your improv line like ended up catching on, and you're like. That's right. That That's was my right. improv. That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I, I grew up do you know touring with Second City and and you know I started with a guy named Chris Farley. That's how old I am. A thousand years ago, where you would just be <laughs> like in a van traveling around the country, getting out, just being an absolute savage. You know, so I it wasn't like, you know, I was. I, I was ready for the moment because mm -hmm. you have to be ready in terms of like owning the text and then an improviser. Mm -hmm. And then that leads us to stand up. You know, by the time I did stand up, you know, and you, you hear a lot of, as you know, from being in the what game. What age, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, 217 is when I. So I was around Moses' I, I, time, gotcha. Yeah. yeah I was, <laughs> Old Testament vibes. I was around when the Dead Sea was still sick. Okay. That's how old I am. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I. It's interesting. The first time I ever did stand up, um, I, I got a call from my agent saying, "Just for laughs, Montreal, biggest." Yeah, but, that was your first time. <laughs> yeah, but by the way, I didn't know what it was. So it was my theatrical agent. So I'm going, "Oh, this is this is something that's scripted, right? So this is an acting gig." He goes, "Yeah, it's not scripted. They want you just to kind of be. The, it's a great thing for you. Don't worry about it. You're going to crush it." So I, I take Hilarious. a, no I take a comic way. with me. We get there. This is not a. Um, this is not a bit. This is word for word true, right? So I get there, and we show up at the venue. It's like forty five hundred seats, and they're like, "Okay, so tomorrow, uh, you're gonna do it live." I go, "Oh, it's live." Okay, <laughs> and they're like, "We're gonna. It's gonna be. It's, it's filmed. You know, it's gonna be all across the, the country." And um, so we need you to open with a quick twenty. And I go, 20 what? They go, they go, 20 minutes of stand-up. I go, oh, I'm not a stand-up. They go, you'll be fine. What? You'll be fine. So I went to dinner with my buddy. He goes, he, he went white. He was already a white man. He went whiter than white. And he just goes, all right, man, we're... we're um, and he goes, all right, tell me, just tell me a, a story that you think is funny right now. Just We're going to build on this. So I told him the story about going to the Golden Globes with my mom and... And just introducing my mom to Meryl Streep, and my mom literally froze and couldn't move, and it was just like she was paralyzed because like that's her hero and blah blah. So he goes, "Okay, great, shut up. You're gonna tell that story, but you're never gonna finish that story. All you're gonna do for 20 minutes, that's gonna be your through line, is try to tell that story, and we're gonna build little interruptions. You're gonna throw me out. We're gonna get the people. You're gonna check your phone, bro. That we, was we, planned. We had to, we had to construct 20 minutes." In one night, I'd never done stand up in my life. So I was so dumb that thank God I didn't know how hard stand up is and, 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 and having to, I had not navigated that space. So ignorance was bliss. I mm -hmm. got up there on live TV and did 20 minutes of what someone might somehow consider stand up. It wasn't stand up, it was survival. I've never seen <laughs> it, I, I don't want to see it. I don't ever want to see it. You've never watched it? Never. That, that's I never the, want to see it. I, seen I never it. want to you see it. You fired the guy from the, the audience. Yeah, but I don't, don't even tell me because it was a nightmare. It was great. Really? I mean, bro, if you're telling me that you went on stage not even knowing you're doing stand up. Never done stand up in my life. Okay. What, Just you're telling me you've never been at home one day and been like, come on, I'm, I'm just, I got to watch this. Did that never, start your love never. for stand up? <laughs> never. Never. It would be like, yeah, remember that time you got punched in the face behind the 7-Eleven? Yeah, I don't ever want to <laughs> ever want to see that. Really? It felt no. that terrible? No, it did. it's not that it felt terrible. It's just that um, it, for me, it's the lowest level of creativity because it wasn't anything I worked for. Mm. I got thrown up there and I had to just survive. Yeah. I don't want to see myself surviving. Yeah. You know? Kind of like this podcast. Good night, everyone. Dude, dude, all right. Make sure you unsubscribe. This, is, this show sucks. And don't forget to say our agents no. Uh, okay, so I want to peel it back real quick because I like to I like to peel back moments that that mean a lot. And there was one you were you were going about. You you was thirty seven. You got your award, and you said, "There's nothing fresh about my face." Yeah. There is a man that is in your shoes right now. He's thirty six. He he's done forty movies. He's taken everything that some of them he should have said no to. 
He's taking all this stuff, and now he's getting to the point where he's like, is this ever going to fucking happen for me? I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I trained harder than all these motherfuckers like Kevin Hart and The Rock. They don't, they don't even train. They never went to school, which we could talk about that bit. I love that bit. What do you tell the man that is uninspired that is one year away from making an Ari move? Hmm. Well... This is going to get very spiritual, so I apologize. But I, I think that I think if he's exhausted, he has to recognize that, and he that's that's depression, and that's for a reason, and that's the universe, maybe or something is telling him that whatever he's doing is draining his life force, and so there are diff different ways. I, I don't know if he meditates. I don't know if he goes inward. I don't know if he's trying to find validation from outside sources and he's like, if I'm not celebrated, I'm nothing. I don't know this person you're Say talking about. Say he's a spiritual man. I Are believe in about Jesus. Yourself? No, oh, first okay. of all, I'm not 36 <laughs> and I think I'm doing pretty good for myself. Okay. <laughs> so he's a spiritual man. Maybe yeah. he believes in Jesus. Maybe okay. he doesn't believe in Jesus. He has a higher power that he worships, but yes, okay. you're right. He's at, you're saying that he's being drained out. Yeah. But, but I just think he needs to recognize that. And, um, you know, certain things can, can give you a perspective, um, you know, taking the time to, to, to quiet all, you know, the circus of your mind, um, your critics, the devil, the greatest thing the devil ever did was to, to pre pretend he didn't exist or try to convince people he doesn't exist. Amen. There's something that, you know, if you, if you're a slave to those thoughts and those doubts and those fears, you're going to be drained. Um, so maybe just... Go away, take a break, get some perspective, but also find something else that he loves. Um, you know, uh, whatever that is, you know, that's not uh, like a, a vocation that's going to like pay him, you know, like whatever it is, whatever that hobby or something that he that he can fall in love with and get away from and then come back to it. Um, I remember when I started doing stand up, someone said to me, when you go back to acting, you're going to be a better actor because of the stand-up. And I thought, that doesn't even make any sense. Like, I'm going to be a better actor because I'm doing... And, yeah. and, and, and they were right. I'm a better actor now than I've ever been in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I had to learn how to tap dance for this role. And I've been playing the drums my whole life. And then I went back to playing the drums after just tapping for all these years. And I was a much better drummer because I was rhythm. playing the drums with my feet. Mm. And then suddenly like that was like gone to a whole other level, you know? So you, you just, you know, there are certain things this guy could do. Who knows what it is uh, that'll come back and, you know, he's exhausted. He's depressed. Um, he needs it, something to rejuvenate his happiness. Yeah, your, your, your body, ex he's, there's something, he's exhausted playing this what uh, being a slave to his whatever fill in the blank ambition yeah. uh, something i don't know I I, love at that. some point you're going you to reveal deep. who this person is maybe at the end of the episode <laughs> yeah, because I'm close to that age. Fucking exhausted. <laughs> um, okay, so what is the fa okay besides playing Ari? What is the f most favorite and passionate project? Because I know we have a project coming out called Sweetwater. Yeah, and I want to dive into it. If I, by the way, I might get smoked for this because I know there's something going on with SAG, and we're not allowed to pro we're not promoting the movie. We're not promoting the movie that's coming out on September first. We're not promoting it. Yeah. But I want to know about your character and what you did to get ready for this character. And what did it do to you? Well, it's so funny. The one thing they, they said is don't talk about... My bad. It's not you. It's me. You, you getting ready for the character. Um, oh. <laughs> um, well, Sweetwater's already been out in theaters. And it's, as you said, I'm just repeating you. Look at all these rules that we're like. We're so nervous. Jumping through. Yeah. I mean, you know... Um, it, it comes out September first. It's about the first African American that that plays in the NBA, Nat Sweetwater Clifton, and um, Everett Osborne plays it brilliantly, and and the great Kevin Pollack and Carrie Carrie Elways. It's it's a brilliant cast, and I, I play a guy that that uh, was the coach of the New York Knicks that actually um, witnessed this brilliant player. The guy was playing in the Harlem Globetrotters, 
and then he facilitated him getting into the NBA, which changed the NBA. I mean, the idea that there were only white dudes in the NBA is is kind of insane. Yeah. Now it's like white dudes are trying to break into the <laughs> NBA. Yeah, 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 it's 100%. like the reverse. Yeah. yeah. It, it was a quick reverse. It yeah. was a quick <laughs> reverse. Oh, oh, we could play. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's all. That's all they did. Oh, we could play now. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, so they all became uh, coaches, and then the guys that stretched them out in the locker room. Oh man, I'm gonna get hated for that. <laughs> so in this coach like you know mentality character can we find kind of like little notes of ari in there because you know as a coach there's a lot of power well, behind that well you know it, 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 i'm glad that you asked that because the the number one question i used to get when i was playing ari gold was how much are you like ari which means how much of an asshole are you really <laughs> yeah. that's what it means um and uh coach joe lapchick who i played I, as soon as I read this role, there's certain roles you read and you go, oh, my God, I, I, I would be so lucky to play this guy. And mm -hmm. I really meant that. Like, I grew up, I was the only white boy on my football team. I got to really, I was lucky enough to go to a truly integrated high school. Um, it was an incredible experience. Which, um, by the way, my aunt went to your high school. Yeah. It, and didn't she, did she say how great or interesting? She, the, she literally the, said there was only three white dudes and he was one of them. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Jackie I, Yarrow, by any way. Do you remember her or no? Um, very forgettable face. That's cr very cruel. <laughs> it's fucked up when he says I'm cruel. I, <laughs> I remember the name. I remember the name. And just pull up a picture if you can. Yeah, let's see it. You don't. You don't have to look at it now, but we'll um, have it ready. All right. Uh, yeah, I just was very lucky because we all got to like interact. You know, like you gravitated towards people who were just, you felt good around, you know, for whatever reason. And so, you know, um, everything, nothing was based on uh, color or, or overcorrecting because of color. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just all just like, it was just the way it was supposed to be. So I was just very lucky. And so like, I almost, when, when this role came about where I got to play a guy that helped break the color barrier, I thought, man, this is cool. Mm -hmm. This is really cool, and I really connect with this guy. And I think that Coach Joe Lapchick is the most like me of any character I played. I, I just was very, very connected to this dude and loved playing it and had an incredible time. And, uh, and then when we were out there promoting it, we would go to like the All-Star Game, you know, it's like we were just everywhere. I was just like became a super fan. Mm -hmm. And so that was really fun. That's were incredible. you a fan of basketball before you took this role? Very much so. Because I grew up in Chicago, so I grew up watching. Michael Jordan. Michael, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was watching Jordan live. How, how do you feel of him as a, as a player and as a person? The few times I've met him, I, I, I was shocked at how cool he was. Um, I, I knew his right-hand man, George, uh, who's in The Last Dance. Um, and The Last Dance was incredible. I've seen it a thousand times. And, you know, we we all will always love MJ. And MJ has a competition disorder, you know, like Kobe. You know, they just have to continuously compete. And, and we're thankful for it because he brought us six championships and there will never be anyone like him. And that's just a fact. And the few times I've met him, I remember, like, you know, everyone goes to pay homage to him every year. He does, like, his his, his Nike party at the all-star game and and one year um he had prince play his private party and so i was sitting there watching prince standing next to michael jordan and jordan had never seen prince perform wow. so it was like just this incredible moment yeah mm -hmm. and dude that's crazy what, you got, a, party. That, what yeah. a what a thing to watch yeah one of the greatest players watching the greatest most amazing entertainers that ever exist yeah i heard uh Prince act. I, I heard. I don't know. I never met him, right? But I heard he acted like royalty, and that's why, like, he went off the vibe of Prince. Um, I, I mean, he was definitely a you know, you know, all you have to do to put things his his skills in perspective, like, you YouTube a moment where uh, Tom Petty and all the greatest players in the world are playing while my guitar gently weeps, and then he launches into a solo, and. You know, it's otherworldly. He was tapped into source. Like that dude was, whatever he was, he was different. And you know, um, mm. and yeah, he, he he was probably. I think he had some difficulty uh, being in his in his mortal body. I remember Common, the hip hop artist Rashid, 
Common, who I did uh, Smoke and Aces with, brought me to um, a party at Prince's house. And Prince was just walking around in his pajamas, sucking on a lollipop. And, and I'm not making this up. And his bodyguard, like, pushed me up against the wall because you weren't really allowed to, you know, have a moment with him. You just kind of like, I was just getting smushed. And I was like, well, I, you know, I'm here. <laughs> We're all supposed to be here. Carolyn, look, like, look straight at just, him. Can I just look at his lollipop? Like, what's going on? <laughs> the fact that he's in PJs and a lollipop yeah. alone. Yeah. Don't you dare look at the lollipop. Right. <laughs> Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, he was pretty incredible. But everyone there was like Chappelle and like Jamie Fox. It was everyone that was there was like you know, invited. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, bro, I'm not gonna tackle him. Like, come on, <laughs> let's just have a moment with Prince. Dude, that's crazy yeah. that celebrities are, are are like pushed away like fans. It's like, dude, what are yeah. you talking? about? I took my shoes off before I walked in here. Right, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I was invited here. Would you say that's your most memorable party that you've been to in Hollywood? Ooh. That that was the that was probably the craziest, just because I love Chappelle, you know, and there he was, and he's really great and totally present and a, a great guy. Um, yeah, everyone was there. Definitely, right. everyone was there. And then like, then he'll just start playing, that's for you Prince, know, yeah. and then that's that's a whole other thing. And then it was revealed that it wasn't even his house. And it was Carlos Boozer's house, who's a player in the NBA. And then Carlos came home, and Prince had put his symbol everywhere in his home. And suddenly on his front gate, it was the Prince symbol. No way. Yeah, you got to have Carlos Boozer on this show, and he'll tell you that story. That, that guy like, logoed he, his house? He logoed his house. <laughs> it would be like you coming back here, and someone, you know. Made it feel like home? You know. <laughs> logoed it up. You know. I mean, was he really all that mad? He was like, it's Prince. I guess it's okay. It's I would. Bad. I you would know. very much. Hey, first of all, two things it. I didn't appreciate. One, your guy pushed me when you're eating the lollipop. This is my house. I don't know what the fuck that was about. What? Two, stop logoing everything. How did you even get to the bottom of my pool? <laughs> exactly. It was everywhere. Was it in the pool? Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. It would be like you letting Mayweather, you know, stay at your place and then the money team just put you know their well they could fuck me up so that i would yeah. i would probably let that one happen that one <laughs> that one i'd be like make yourself at home even though it doesn't feel like a home it looks like it's staged but just take it what is your affiliation with um the paul brothers um so i my my career start wait it was that wait hold on hold on how did we even get there <laughs> because i i was thinking about floyd and then i started thinking about jake oh yeah got you and then logan Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so Logan and Jake, I met them uh, in 2017, I believe it was like, um, yeah, no, 2016. It's when I first came out to LA. I came out to be a musician and uh, I was writing music and uh, I met Logan at the gym. Okay. And at the gym, I saw this man and I, I and I'm, I, I'm not afraid to let people know I'm a fan of them. Like I, okay. I, because I just felt like at the time, until this today, I still do. If somebody comes up to you and says, dude, I love Ari, you're not going to be like, get yeah. the fuck out of here, bro. You're, you're going to well, be like, I am, but yeah, go ahead. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but you know, also fits your character, fits your character. No. Uh, well, I, I'd appreciate if somebody liked me for my art. So I walked up to him and I said, hey, man, you make those skits online. Yeah. And he's like, I do. And I like a little fanboy. I was like, well, dude, I could sing. I could dance. I could. And I just started showing him like all oh. these talents that I have. I'm like, bro, I could, I could do anything. Like, bro, just fucking put, like, try me, try me. And he's like, all right. And he even said, he goes, there was something weird but magical about that moment where he's like, I'm going to give this dude my number. And so uh, one day he hit me up. He goes, hey, man, I'm doing this Vine. And I didn't even know what Vine was. It was like an app right. that did six second videos. Yeah. And I knew that these kids were special, bro, because I walked up. And he's like, dude, I'm doing this video with my bro. And it's like, liar, liar, pants on fire. And he sets me on fire. And I go, oh, pretty cool. And in my mind, I'm like, D how are they getting these effects if they're shooting off their iPhone? Right. Then he comes up to me. He's like, yeah, anyways, bro. So like, what? And while he's talking to me, he's dumping gasoline on himself. And I'm like, hey, oh man, God. are you going to light yourself on fire? He goes, yeah, real quick. But I have a pool right there. Like, that was enough. And I'm yeah. like. Dude, you're pouring a lot of gasoline on yourself. So I'm like, somebody has to tell him. So I look at Jake. This is the first time I meet Jake. I go, Jake, look at this. And Jake goes, dude, more, more. And so he starts putting <laughs> yeah. more gasoline on him. Then they run out and they put, uh, uh, what do you put on your on your boo-boo? Uh, Neosporin? Not Neosporin. That's a scar. Everybody you said on your boo-boo. On I mean, your boo-boo. If you cut it and you put alcohol, alcohol. I don't, I'm sorry okay. about that. Nice. Puts more alcohol <laughs> on him. And I'm like, this can't be real. And the, literally in five seconds, he goes, 
yeah, you're lying. And he throws a match on him and he goes, <laughs> and I'm like, wow, these guys will do anything to entertain. Right. And so we became friends and they kind of, <laughs> they mentored me into showing me how to create videos. And I was blessed with that opportunity and they, they introduced me to their friends. And at the time I, I kind of had a quick business brain. I was like, I have to give something here, right? I, I can't just be a leech. I can't just yeah. sit around and take off their table. So yeah. I came up with that idea of like, if I write ideas, then I'll give it to the influencer, but I'll ask them, you don't have to pay me for this. Just let me be a part of it and tag me in it. Mm. And so I started doing that with a bunch of social media stars. And I was just like a little ghostwriter, like like just in the back, just writing. And then they would tag me in the video and then I grew my own audience and very smart. Kind of just narrowed my way through That's the industry. That's very smart. You gotta reciprocate. You hear that, kids? Mm -hmm. Just don't take. You can't. Yeah. You become a pest. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You gotta contribute. Mm -hmm. I like that. Good lesson. Thank you. Yeah, man. So I could get deep too, bro. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. love, yeah, those guys are killing it, man. You get you gotta give it up to them. You how, know, how, and, and I'm fascinated by him because like, you know, um, you know, we all we all watch the UFC and and we like these elite athletes. And for for Jake to come to it later, you know, and not have a traditional journey that that you know pro fighters and other people have so it's to me it's a it's it's a fascinating experiment to watch you know you got a guy who started later on who's obviously you know he's he's a young strong kid and he's completely dedicated and mm -hmm. he's got the best trainers money can buy right and away he's focused yeah right like it's an amazing experiment to see how far can this guy go how did I, you feel when he first watched it when you first saw him come out as like oh because remember he came from disney and youtube yeah, no but i but i because listen i i know that journey because mm -hmm. when i was doing stand-up people were like anyone thinks they can do stand-up mm -hmm. like no one knows my past or cares and i i love being counted out and it's inspiring to me um, gives you fire yeah and and you know if if you if you work hard and 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 you add that consistency and you're driven and you can see it which they can of course you, we don't know how far it can go and by the way it's already gone so far you know and i don't know them personally but what you know when you're grateful then that only you know will you know kind of manifest more abundance mm. so they're they're on it and it's gonna it's gonna be fascinating to see and you can see him getting better oh, yeah. so you know, much better yeah. did you watch the saturday's fight yes what did you think i just thought he 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 didn't get rattled he stayed in the pocket he was disciplined he looked better mm. you he know. looked a lot better yeah he looked quick his rolls were way quick he wasn't getting gassed out yeah he he performed unbelievably and at this point if you're gonna hate on him for not fighting real boxers or, or there's so there's so many reasons why you can hate somebody if you're finding ways to hate this guy at this point you're just a hater at the end of the day that was but, fucking entertaining as but shit there to are watch people that are just haters and and we wish them well and we send them love because they're <laughs> yeah. in pain exactly mm. did you watch amanda and heather fight I, I you know what i didn't see all of it I don't love watching women getting punched in the face. I'm yeah, not going to lie to you. Weird, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's such a funny laugh. <laughs> So but you do? Yeah, I'm fucking no, so much. You know what? You, so much. You fucking good to the bitch. You want to fucking pull But she's her. so skilled. No, but you know what's funny is I don't, I really don't know anything about fighting. I'm only really watching when we want to see Jake, you know. And so certainly girls, yeah, it's, it's a very different thing to see girls literally pummel each other. It's a very different vibe. But man, I mean, that fight was just insane. That girl hung in what all, was it was the 10 rounds? Yeah. All 10 rounds. I mean, she was just getting beat up and yeah. she stayed through it it was crazy. bro that was yeah. a movie if you I, I really suggest you go watch it it was it was the main event without being the main event it was unbelievable dude yeah, so many people went up to her and was like are you sure you're not done mm -hmm. and she was like no i'm gonna keep going yeah. it was a movie i watched a movie yeah, this girl, first round we thought she was gonna be out first round it, yeah. there was no match for amanda first round and nope like her pain tolerance is High, this real woman. high. Yeah. Have you ever had any issues on set? Have you ever? You don't have to mention a name, but has there ever been somebody you worked alongside where you're like, man, this is very unbearable to work with this person? <clears throat> it, it's, uh, you know, yes, yes. It took me a second to figure that out. There, um, I, and I've I, I have a podcast called How You Live in J. Piven. We're, we're taking a little break right now, but we're going to come back and. 
And um, I need to unpack this one again because Malcolm McDowell um, was on our show. And um, yeah, he and I, um, he revealed that he was doing these things to me to make me angry because our characters were com very combative. So he wanted to get underneath my skin um, so that it could fuel me because apparently he didn't think that I would be uh, able uh, as an actor to uh, be able to evoke those feelings on my own. Which character so, did he play? Uh, he played the uh, viciously mediocre piece of shit, shut the fuck up, I hated him character. No, I'm trying to, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm like trying to think like the who. <laughs> well, damn. Uh, no, he was, he was, um, he was Sloan's father. Uh, oh. Emmanuel Shriki played a father. And he and I had some, some scenes together. And, you know, it was just one of those moments where like, you know, he would, and I, and I, I confronted him on my, on my podcast. Like, why did you do that? And he said, he thought it would really get me going. And, <laughs> and I just thought, you know, I'd already been doing the show for years. I was like, bro, we're, mm. we're good. You don't need to do some method stuff with me. Like I, I, you know, I, as soon as the yell action, I'm going to unleash everything I got, mm. but you know, but, um, and, and, but it was great working with him and he's a brilliant actor and it was all good, but he thought he should do some things that, uh, you know, off Spark camera it. that would just kind of make mm. me insane. One day, uh, I don't know if you remember this episode where Lloyd brings in these two gentlemen who are strippers and I'm kind of handcuffed and they do this dance for me and it was already surreal. Right. So I remember like, I'm a really big fan of Joe Pesci, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm on set and I'm getting ready to do that scene and I hear, oh my God, Joe Pesci's here. And I was like, Joe, Pe why is Joe Pesci here? <laughs> and, and like, I couldn't find him. I didn't know where he was. So we're, we're rehearsing the scene and I'm tied up <laughs> and these two gentlemen rip off their cop uniforms and all of a sudden I hear, yeah, put, put your cock in his face. <laughs> and I look over and Joe Pesci is on our set directing <laughs> and i was like why is joe Pet and i'm i'm handcuffed <laughs> and there's a gentleman in a banana hammock putting his power source in my face and he goes yeah yeah just slap it in his face no you should turn very slowly and then smack it <laughs> you know and and so suddenly and i'm like where's the director like the director wasn't there and joe pesci was directing this gentleman putting his power source directly in my face, smacking me. And it was all very confusing and amazing. And then Joe Pesci left and I never saw him again. It was just like, <laughs> wow. it was like, did that just happen? Was I on mushrooms? You <laughs> he know? had a vision for that one specific scene. That's it. <laughs> yeah. He just came in to direct a, a, a male dancer, smacking me in the face with his cock. That's so that, that was, so that happened. That's a, uh... That's weird, man. I, weird. That's fucking weird. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Do you have like a, a favorite scene or most memorable scene you filmed? Bro, I was just about to ask that. <laughs> you know, and I'm not just saying this. They're all, you know, each one of them is just, there, there were no easy scenes just in, in terms of throwaway. They were all just like, you know, it was just such a great character. You know, um, all the therapy scenes you know, with Perry Reeves, who played my wife. Um, she was just so great. And all those scenes where I got to just unravel. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, I'll never forget the breakout moment for Ari was in episode seven of the first season where it was called Busey in the Beach. And my character up until that moment was, you know, very small. Mm -hmm. my, my character had one and a half scenes in the pilot, you know, just like, you know, just kind of just, you know, kind of a fringe background player, but there, and it got, you know, it's just kind of building, and one of the great things about Doug Allen is he could see, you know, when things were working, and then write for it. Okay, that character's really working. Wow, okay. Ari and Lloyd, there's mm. some chemistry there. Let's let's get this going. So that, my kind of, the character's coming out party was in Malibu, um, where I, it was this great, like, Scorsese tracking shot where I'm just in the house looking for Josh Weinstein, who's trying to poach my client, and it's just oh, following me all yeah, through, yeah, yeah. you know, through the house, through the house, all the way out, one continuous shot from the car to Josh Weinstein, you know, massive, like, three-page monologue, and, you know, just that was so fun, mm. and that was kind of like where the character took off, mm -hmm. and they, you know, and then from there, there was kind of no looking back, so right. I remember that one for sure. Did, when you got the role and got casted for it, did you know it was going to be a substantial character? Or? No, it was, I mean, that's, that was the, the great kind of lesson that if, if 
you know, people listening, take it, take this, remember this. So at the time, you know, I'm not a kid. I'm in, I'm in my mid thirties. I'd been, you know, four, I was 40 movies into my career. I was doing leads and blah, blah, blah. And the, the role was one scene and I was being offered, you know, the lead in this other show, but, um, I, the show itself was written so well, you're in such good company, HBO, all these variables, mm -hmm. the character could be incredible if I do my thing. Mm -hmm. We know that Ari Emanuel is this incredible character that if we could kind of unpack that, there'll be something there. So, you know, you just got to kind of bet on yourself and, and, and everything, all the variables that are there and, you know, not take the easy money. Literally and figuratively, because right. there was like very little money. I took about a 80% pay cut to do the role. Yeah. And, but by the way, as you know, from the story you told about working with the boys, like you work your butt off and it, it'll come. Money so, will always come. Never chase money. Yeah, exactly. So um, I just went in and I just knew that if I stay focused and did my thing, things will come to fruition. And the character is fascinating and... It, it it will it'll it'll manifest itself and it did amen yeah, yeah. so you got to kind of like put the easy money aside and just grind you stuck right. to your heart you knew yeah. that this was the direction you wanted to go yeah thank and god it a, became fruitful yeah, yeah and as actor you know you pick the one that felt the best and the felt the, like the best character which is the best thing you can do you know as an actor pick the role that felt i wonder how many valuable uh, i wonder yeah. how many people made the wrong decision mm. by choosing the money and the main character because a lot of people want to be the main mm. i want to be the main i worked hard right. I, I none of these people were in acting class my, my favorite stand-up bit you did was um i don't know if it's in your special but it's when you talk about Dwayne the rock johnson mm. bro i i died because like the, it's like there's so much truth to that part and I always tell people there's movie stars and then there's actors. Movie stars play the same character in every single movie. Yeah. And, then, and then an actor could take a character and bring it to life. Um, yeah. is, can you, t do you well, talk I about mean, that? Well, I mean, he's a force. I mean, The Rock is a force and, and he's a brand and people mm -hmm. can watch that and learn from him. And he will always continue to find a new lane for himself. Of course. I mean, they should literally, you know, just like study that guy. <laughs> it's just kind of amazing. For real. Right. You know what I mean? Like Schwarzenegger, you know, just, just would just continue to like blow your mind and find a new lane and master it. Um, and he's, a, you know, he's a, he's a massive movie star and he's not, you know, a trained actor. And so I, I just somehow, I, I think what happened was, to be honest with you, um, my mic broke at the uh, Laugh Factory one night. And so I did the entire show without a mic. And um, I was, you know, going on, having fun. I don't remember what the bit was about The Rock. You know, I said, you know, he's, he's never taken an acting class and he's the highest paid actor in the world. And my mic broke. And I said, can you guys hear me in the back? You want to know why? Because I took an acting class. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I could, I, could hit, I could hit the back row. I could fill any room funny, without yeah. a microphone. And so you just, you, from, from accidents, you know, come a fun bit. Because you always got to, as you know, from stand-up, just stay on your game and work with the crowd and all that kind of stuff. So, but then I also take shots at myself. And it's, I'm sorry, I'm bitter. You know what no, I mean? No, it, was a, perfect, it yeah. was a perfect joke. You could tell that you meant no harm in it. But yeah. it was a great it was a great tie. Also, it was it was more like you were bashing yourself. So it wasn't like you were coming after him. It was a yeah. it was a great joke. I really I, did it, like it. It's like, yeah, do I you know, he's the highest paid actor. Do I sound bitter? He's a, you know, I'm playing the rusty chuckle bucket right now for eleven people. I'm bitter. I'm very bitter. <laughs> I'm performing next to a Dave and Busters. Yeah, that's I'm, all in a, it is. I'm in a fucking mall. So um, <laughs> yeah, I'm uh I'm I'm getting ready to do the uh, the improv in Brea, the Brea Improv on September 1st. Okay, amazing. That's nice. a good, good little... I'm uh, going to put everything in the description. So take a look at the description, look at his tour dates. Yeah. And, uh, and a link where people can buy tickets. Yeah, it's been a blast, man. I love it. You just, you know, you, you just... The only way to do it is, as you know, you know, you do as many shows a night and a week and you just keep grinding and getting better until you have that set that you feel good with, you know, mm -hmm. and then you got to curate the best version of that. And I'm getting ready. I know that people are going to be like, if nothing else, they're going to be like, can this dude actually do it? You know, and I love being on lineups with all these killers because mm -hmm. then it's up to me to kind of show up and do my thing. Yeah. But that's what you do. Yeah. Well, I mean, you get it. Not everyone gets it. 
I mean, my background is Second City sketch comedy, improv, years of being on the stage, writing my own dialogue, you know, improvising, blah, blah, blah. All these things are different variables that could lead to doing stand-up, but no one knows that nope. or cares. Mm -mm. So everyone's different. It's, it's more like, you know, stand-ups, the first thing they say to you is, how long have you been doing it, man? You know, mm -hmm. but with actors, you never go up to another actor, how long have you been acting? You don't do that on set. Yeah, you know? it's a more cutthroat. It's like if because I don't want you to shine. I, I've been doing this, so get behind me, get behind me. Um, that is what honestly that was my biggest fear. My biggest fear wasn't bombing on stage. My biggest fear was I know I came because Joe Coy brought me onto the stage, mm. and so all these stand-up comedians showed me respect, not because I earned it, because Joe put his name on me. And so through that, like, I was very nervous to perform in front of people that are talented, but also they earned the rights to call themselves a stand-up, and they put in the time and hours to become a stand-up. And so I would be very quiet. I never promoted that I was doing stand-up. I always took any slot that they wanted to give me. And I came and I showed them what I could do. And then yeah. they came up to me and said, okay, you're okay. I, I, now I understand why you want to do this. Yeah. But I didn't walk in being like, no, 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 let me, because I'm social media famous. I could do this. And that was my biggest fear is watching them be like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Like, go back to the internet. And I was like, right. all right. But I'll tell you this, this is something you're going to know, uh, very true to your heart. There's nothing like a live performance. No. Nothing. And I wish everybody could at least try it once. Because yeah. that, that, that feeling of the audience all narrowed and focusing their energy centered on you is something that like rejuvenates me. I don't know. It's like it's the best drug anybody could ever take. Yeah. And, and people's biggest fear is bombing. And what's so great is if they only knew, if they got up there and experienced it, because it's hell. When you're, I'll never forget, I was at the Dime. This, this little, I even asked Chappelle, I was like, if you ever play the dime? He goes, oh, man, you know, that's a tough room, dude. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, Chappelle thought it was a tough room? And it is. It's like, you know, 11 people in this yeah. tiny little bar. And you all gotta, comedians. Yeah, and they're all just heckling you in the back, and you got a little pit. So you can't see anything. Oh, the red place that we went to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're on like a little, like, you know, you know, cardboard it's a box. Yeah, it's not even a it's stage. A, yeah, it's, 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 it's you're wobbling if you yeah. move too much. You can't see. You can't. It, it, it's a nightmare. And... You know, I remember bombing so badly there, and you, you the, the the feeling that, you know, you, everything in your, every fiber of your being is saying, just get out, get yeah. off that stage, run. You've <laughs> never been funny in your whole life. You know what I mean? You start doubting, you know, everything. And if you can somehow breathe and work through that and dig your way out, then you have that memory locked in mm -hmm. to your cells of like, oh, okay, I've been in it. I've mm. been, I, I, I remember this is the worst it's ever been and I didn't panic so that you get that much better so that next time, okay, uh, you know, uh, I'm that much better and I've already experienced hell and yeah, I can do this. And if people, their fear is the unknown, obviously, mm. and they fear that feeling of bombing, but if they were, if they got up there and then work through it, then that's so empowering, then you can only kind of move forward. Mm. It's only up. Yeah, it's heavy. I have a question. Yeah. But before I ask you that question, the best advice that Joe Coy ever gave me, I was about to open up for him. My knees are shaking. Like I'm just, I, I can't even move, can't breathe. He leans in. He goes, dude, dude, I'll let you know a little secret. He goes, if you go up there right now and you kill it or if you bomb it, when I get up there, They'll fucking forget you. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, he goes, don't overthink it. You're yeah. going to bomb. You're going to succeed. And no yeah. one will remember. Yeah. And so to me it was like, oh, shit. All the highlights that we get excited about in our yeah. life, we forget about them. And all of the shit moments that we have in our life, we forget about them. And it's, it's, not, it's not a problem to fail. But I have one question that I think that me and you could relate on. You were, uh, when you started doing stand-up, you were already yeah. a successful name. Yeah. Were you not nervous of, I can't even fucking practice without people putting my name already comparing to my time doing stand-up? Because these gentlemen could practice as, when you're a stand-up, usually people are doing stand-up to be at an Ari level, right? So they do stand-up so they could get that role to play a really strong character on a, on a movie or a TV show. You came from finding success to doing stand-up. Did you find pressure and, oh, I already have to be as good as my name? Um, n not, I, 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 I was smart enough to know that 
um, succumbing to pressure um, is not your friend. And, and I just knew, because I've been performing since I was eight years old with no rust on me, literally without stopping. So um, I, I do know as a performer that if you're totally present and you don't get in your own way, um, then you might get lucky and hit something that's kind of magical. And you work your ass off and do, and, you know, do all the hard work so that when you are totally present, you know, like, for instance, when you're doing a scene, if you're reaching for your lines, you're not going to crush it. Yeah. But if you own them and you're totally present and playing off the scene and you're in a state of play, like stand-ups in, in, in great moments, like um, you, you've got a chance of doing something magical. But you've got to set yourself up to win like that. Otherwise, you'll never win. You know, if you're reaching for a line or if you're succumbing to your nerves or you're distracted or whatever. But just, you know, put put yourself in that position where you, you could get lucky and something great could happen. In the same way with stand-up, I just knew that if I put more pressure on me, no one's going to win. It's all yeah. going to be bad. So, like, it's already difficult. Yeah. So, you know, you, you find those rooms. I, I just don't, th I, to be honest with you, I don't think about how I'm perceived. I don't ever go there. So I'm not putting that pressure on me. What made you that way, if you don't mind me asking? like what? Because if, from this hour that we've been talking, yeah. if I had to drive in the vehicle of what you were using, it's it's not mostly talent, it's mostly hard work and passion. Keep pushing, don't stop. That's yeah. what I've picked up on you. But yeah. how did you get that mindset? Was it something your mother taught you? Is it is it your schooling that taught you that? But what taught you that? I'm not gonna care what they're thinking, I gotta focus on my craft and my work. Well, I mean, my parents were both very different. My father was really hard on me. Like, when he would direct me, if I'm not progressing in rehearsal, he one time said to me, there's one actor in this room and you ain't it. So what do you got, man? Because you're, 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 right now, this isn't it. You know what I mean? I was like, ah, ah. It's your dad. Yeah. What if I just started crying like a bitch right now? <laughs> what are you talking about? I'll be like this. I'm like, yes, <laughs> zoom, zoom. <laughs> Too many is losing it. This is it. This is the moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, and then my mom would, would give, you know, she would celebrate you and go, oh, man, this was so great. This was so great. And then she would ask you a question or say, what if? And you didn't even realize you were getting a direction. So a little good cop, bad cop or whatever. So they, they led by example. They didn't want me to become an actor, but... They gave me all the tools to become one, but I just learned pretty quickly. Like, um, yeah, if for me, there are some people that um, everyone. I I just knew if if I didn't work and find that consistency, um, I I I would. I don't want to do something. It's like respect the space you occupy. Mm. Like I don't want to take someone else's space, and I respect that space that we occupy when we perform. Mm. So you got to just you, you you take it seriously, and and if I'm going to get up there and do it, I'm going to earn it and work hard and and be the best version of what I can be in this moment. That's it. And so, you know, um, so that's really kind of where it comes from. Maybe maybe also just deep fear and insecurity of being mediocre. I just don't, maybe something like that. I don't know. I'm just not a fan of mediocrity. I think that <laughs> from what I heard of what you said, I don't think your dad let you be mediocre. And I, um, and I, and I, you know, do you ever, do, do, I know there's probably moments that you probably hated your dad, but, uh, no, never, no, never. Because I, I know that he, he didn't have me do anything that he wouldn't do. You know what I mean? So he was leading by example. He was an actor and a director and a teacher and all that stuff. And he was, you know, I would perform with him and he would school me. He would crush me. Mm. Um, and he was great. And he just wanted me to be, the, you know, just to to work hard and, and, and see, you know, how, you know, in that moment, don't take it for granted and see just, just to respect it and respect the space and, and yeah, but in, you know, you're right. In that moment when he would embarrass me in front of my friends, yeah, I would get, I would get angry, and I didn't, you know, want to do it. And and um, yeah, it wasn't until there was a turning point moment with with my family where, by the way, my father never got to see me do Entourage. He passed away before that happened. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. May rest in peace. Can I, can I ask you, what does that feel like? Hmm. 
Now it's really going to get emotional. Now I'm going to start. Um, no, uh, he, listen, it's all good. It, it's, it's all happening as it should, you know? Believe me, it's all good. It's all good. It's meant to be. Why'd you guys bring me down? I'm so sorry. What the I, hell? I, I didn't so mean to bring you down. I just know that, uh, that I know that, like, every, every father uh, is so proud of their son when they're doing what their heart desires is and they're killing it. And so I, I'm, I'm just super grateful that your mother was there to rehearse with you. And Oh, my God, she still is. I'm yeah. probably going to go see her after this. And yeah. I think it's it's almost like what an homage to him, you know. I think that him being that kind of, that power force, you know, being kind of like, as you said, the the bad cop on the side of things. I think that that, that really prepares you as an actor, you know, to take on the millions of no's that you're going to get. And, and that when you do get that one yes, like Entourage, it's going to be extra sweet. And I think that he prepared you for that, you know. Oh, thank you, bro. Which, um, is, which is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, no, he prepared me for all that. That's for sure. But you can't, you can't regret, you can't change anything. Um, and, you know, it was, it's not really about me. It's, a, it's, it's about him. I got to see him thrive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and he prepared me for those moments. And, and um, you know, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm incredibly lucky that, you know, my mom, as I said earlier, she, she's the one that handed me this short story of the performance, which, you know, is the best performance of my life the, the movie that will be done within two weeks so like you know um he we're all connected to our our family and he's around and i i feel him and um yeah there's we we have to just be you know present to notice that they you know the, it's a cliche that they say that they're going to be you know after they pass on they look after us you know and that i i really do feel like he does mm-hmm. I don't know the man, but I pray that my son has the same respect that you have for your father and that, that heart you have. And Thank you. I, I know right now, if there is a beautiful possibility, there's no shot that he's not looking down on you with just unbelievable excitement. Thank you, man. I, I, I appreciate that. I really do. Now, if I can only find a wife and end this horrible charade, we'll be okay. Okay, get on it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get, get a list of people. So what's your dating life like? Oh, man. Um, I talk about that on stage a lot. Yeah. Uh, which, it's such, a great, uh, it's such a great, fun, fertile premise to talk about, to be a really old white dude still dating. Um, <laughs> this is how you know you're old I used to look at a girl in a short skirt I'd be like god damn she's hot Now I'm like I wonder if she's cold <laughs> <laughs> That's the type of hilarity you will see kids At the Brea Improv on the, September 1st let's go. Yay Can we end this for, I feel Absol- like I, I can't tell if we've been here for two minutes or three we, days It was been one hour and 17 beautiful minutes Thank yes. you so much for coming Thank yes, you guys That was awesome I, I It's really good appreciate to be here it. At this um, witness protection program. Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. If you ever need safety, come here. Yes. We'll I, shield you. I, I love it. I will come back, man. You guys, congratulations on your show. Thank you and so all much. your success. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you for coming on. Yes. We're a huge fan of you and your career, and we're excited about Sweetwater. We're excited Thank about you. your stand-up. And uh, whenever you need us in your corner, we'll, we'll grab this whole witness protection program family and <laughs> we'll be come there. to me next yeah, time. Yeah, with, yeah, different exactly. names, with different names. With different names. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank you, guys. Thank you, bro. It was a pleasure.